If you're here, you already sense there's something out there, something magical and mysterious, just waiting for you to find. And you've probably already discovered it isn't as easy as just thinking happy thoughts. You're not alone. Generations of shamans, philosophers, seers, and scientists have pursued this eternal quest. Where their ideas come together, you'll find powerful tools to cultivate magic and self-mastery in your own life. Welcome to the Magic and Mastery Podcast. I'm your host, Donna Woodwell. I'm a former journalist, an author, a master astrologer, and a hermetic initiate, and it's my honor to be your guide. In each episode, I'll meet you at the crossroads of science and spirit, reason and intuition to help you discover the wisdom that works for you. Are you ready? The adventure awaits. Welcome back to the Magic and Mastery Podcast. This is episode 18, Good Night Moon. So we have an epic episode for you today. We're going to talk about all things moon. Meaning, well, Chris said it in one. We're going to talk about the polarity of the moon and how it can help you cure a multitude of ills in your life. Yeah, no, this was a fun episode, one that's very dear to my heart, and we are definitely going to be talking about the moon a little bit more as well, because we can only cover so much. But before we dive in, don't forget that we've added headings and timestamps to the show notes, as well as links to all the books uh, referenced during this episode. There'll be a few, along with some other things, so you can find those over at the show notes at www.magicandmastery.com slash podcast. And as always, don't forget... To stay until the end of the episode. Donna has a, a particularly, I love this exercise she gives everyone. And hopefully you're not, while, while you're not driving, particularly on this one. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, let's get started. Welcome back to Magic and Mastery. This is episode 18. We're going to talk about all things having to do with the moon. So Chris, I am so glad we are here together. I know we're talking about the moon today because we just spent the first 10 minutes backstage talking about food. So I figure that has something to do with the moon, right? Oh, it totally does. Let's get that comfort food in there. Yeah, fantastic. We're talking about the moon. and You might be asking that question. Donna, why are you talking about the moon? You bounce around a lot in topics. Well, we are talking about the moon. It's because we really don't bounce around as much as you think we do. All of the episodes, somewhere in there, has come up the issue of polarity. And so we thought that just bringing in the moon as an allegory of what polarity means in practicality would be a good place to start because it's physical, everybody can see it, everyone can experience it, and it can open a lot of doors. So, Chris, what say you? I say, Donna, the moon is uh, actually a perfect antidote for our modern sort of ailments and, and world, particularly the yang, constant action, Western patriarchal reality where we have to constantly be on the go. She's the perfect antidote because she, te- she teaches us her tides, the waxing and waning cycles of the moon, teaches us to let go that we are in these cycles of building up and then releasing. And that's super important to realize that we, you know, we are in these natural rhythms and we do need to step back and we do need to release and process and rest and restore before the cycle starts again. So the moon's lovely. She's a perfect um, ally and a perfect representative of sort of uh, this changing flow state that we're always in. All right, we're going to come back to this because Chris gave away the punchline before we actually got through the entire episode. But, you know, it's a good thing to keep in mind while we are going through uh, all things moon. Because, honestly, that is the point. If you are feeling exhausted, burned out, stressed, anxious, and all those things eventually at their extreme become depression, chances are... You have been caught in the trap of our modern world, which, as Chris said, is go, 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 keep going, never shut up and never stop. And until we all learn to stop the go, 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 there is no place else to end up except for burnout. 
That is the natural human physiological response to living a life out of balance, which is why I personally love working with the moon. Because the moon, you know, watch her from tonight to night. She, she like clockwork, gets brighter and brighter and brighter, and then dimmer and dimmer and dimmer, and then brighter and brighter and brighter, and dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And she spends equal time in her bright world and in her dark world. And because everything gets equal time, it's in a natural state of a moving balance. And it's that moving balance that we all need to find a way to incorporate into our own three-dimensional lives and incorporate without feeling guilty or apologetic or, or any of those other things that we pile on ourselves. Or if we're in the position of managing other people, of respecting when we are putting together our work schedules for other people. Because if you don't do that, you will burn out your people as fast as you will burn out yourself. And the concept, the concept that, oh, I don't need that. I don't need that balance. I can just keep going. Oh, you know, I am, what, a superhero? What do we call it? A ubermensch <laughs> something? <laughs> something uh, that's I, I'm too important for that. You know what? In the short term, you might be able to get away with it. But in the long term, it will always, always, always come back because you are going against the flow of life. And life requires a balance in some way, shape, or form. So how is that? That's absolutely perfect. Just and Lay um, down the law lay down the law and it's actually it's so true too i mean if you want to take it in the context too that we're you know made up with 70 percent water and the way the moon covers those tides we're subjected to her we're totally subject and um it's an important um rhythm and to get an, get in, attuned to because if we are constantly going 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 and you're right and we ignore that and we do end up getting ill or just burning ourselves out um, you got to like kind of ask yourself, are you really going to like make that marathon journey? And um, yeah, so she's super important. We've, we've already determined Chris and I like science. We may talk about a lot of woo, but we also are kind of jazzed by any kind of sciencey things. I love the science of the moon. Now, when I first read the stories of how we got a moon, I was thoroughly enchanted. Because if you look around at the rest of the planets in our solar system, there's nothing quite like our moon. You know, compared to Jupiter, Jupiter's got lots of moons. Yep, 62 of them or something at last count. Mm -hmm. But they're all small compared to Jupiter. And so our moon is so large compared to the size of the Earth. Yeah. It set the scientists to figuring out, hmm, exactly how did this moon get here? Now, when we sent astronauts up to the moon to collect rocks, we weren't doing it just because we wanted to, like, take souvenirs, you know, <laughs> like you do when you go hiking and you're like, oh, that's a pretty rock. I'll take it home with me. No, <laughs> we took them because we wanted to understand more about how the moon came to be. And the current best theory that they have is that sometime in the very early days in which our our little planet was forming around the sun it was a chaotic time in the solar system things were running into each other bashing here and there well some other planet probably about the size of mars came along and crashed into the earth and what happened was it just spit out a whole plume of debris and that's called ejecta and it first formed a rocky ring around the earth and eventually that rocky ring began to coalesce into what we now think of as the moon and so it's a combination of that planet that struck the earth probably the leftover core and rocks that were thrown up from the earth so it's kind of a hybrid some earth 
and some not Earth. Uh, when it finally coalesced into something that was rather ball-shaped, it was probably much, much, much closer to the surface of the Earth. And since that time, four million years ago, it's just been slowly spinning farther and farther away. And because of the moon, just as much as because of the sun, we have life the way we think about it on this planet. Now, everybody knows that the sun shines, grows the plants, animals eat the plants, people eat the plants and the animals, and life has evolved over time. But what you might not realize is that the moon is doing two major things for us that allowed us as humans to evolve here in a way that might not have been possible had we not had a moon as large as we have. One of them is that it has stabilized the rotational axis of the Earth to be more or less up and down in cosmic terms. Just like, Chris, you know those toys that you like have the string and the little ball and they spin and the, and the ball keeps them sort of spinning around and around on a level plane? Um, the moon yes. is doing more or less the same thing for the Earth. And so like a planet like Mars, it's a little smaller than the, than the Earth, but its moons are really, really tiny. And so it doesn't have that stabilizing factor. So what happens on Mars is that the planet is tipping here and there and everywhere, and different parts of the planet become the North Pole at different times. And so there's no overall stability. The moon has made huge epochs of the Earth's climate relatively stable. And because we have huge, long epochs, that makes the process of evolution have enough time to churn and do its work. And if the climate was changing a lot faster and moving in different parts, it would be difficult to for evolution to keep up. And so therefore, we should be all really grateful that Grandma Moon is around because she's literally nurturing our little blue ball to make the conditions for life much more much more robust, much more predictable, like, like keeping hold of the little nursery. The other thing that she does is, based on what you mentioned before, is that she pulls the water on our planets. Because she's pulling the water, churning the water, she creates these intertidal zones where there are places where the water comes up and the water goes down, and the water comes up and the water comes down. And these are the places where the first more complex forms of life that moved out of the ocean, came up onto land, and could do either or. Also, the reason why our planet is capable of sustaining life that's more complex than just little microbes here or there is because the moon's orbit made these little tidal pool nurseries available to do the chemistry required to be able to create something as gloriously complex as human life. So no sun, no humans, no moon, no humans. Isn't that amazing? I love science. It really is amazing. And thank you so much for breaking that down. I feel like that was the most beautiful, succinct story of the moon creation that I've heard in a long time. So I appreciate that. I'm sure it's called the Thea theory, by the way. And yeah, Thea, yeah. But the one thing you touched upon uh, towards the end that was really pertinent, like, and we mentioned it maybe several episodes ago, we're talking about the um, gradual evolutionary change opposed to clim climatic crisis change. Now, with that slow, gradual ebb and flow sort of journey, like what we were talking about earlier, the importance of this rest and this waxing and waning cycle, that's really important because that's, you know, that kind of governs our, our lives, obviously. But it's very nurturing and it's very gradual and it's okay. Like it kind of shows that it is okay to pull back to rest and then become active again. And it's talking about that long term, that long term change, which is vital. And that, like you said, is the recipe for this complex life that we have here to like, there's no other way to really get that without kind of going through that long haul without having something that is climatic and 
uh, crisis oriented, which is not ideal. I mean, it does happen, but it's not an ideal form of change. It, it reminds us that we have a place to come back to, like a mm -hmm. center to come back to, so that when the Earth does have dramatic climate things happen to us, like, oh, I don't know, an asteroid comes by, hits us, mm -hmm. Oops, there goes North America. Uh, <laughs> you know, bad things can still happen in context. Right. But it gives life a chance to find another way. And so, right. you know, the planet evolved the dinosaurs. And when it was time for the dinosaurs to go, the dinosaurs went. And it evolved a whole life along a whole different model. And right, it's like this governing mechanism. And I find that absolutely astonishingly amazing that we are so fortunate well, it's not even that we are so fortunate. It's like we wouldn't be having this conversation, very likely not having this conversation if the moon was not there. Think about that for a minute. You would not be listening to this podcast if there were no moon in a real science-y kind of way, not in just, you know, Donna's perfect little woo world. And <laughs> and it's true. And one other thing you touched upon is that the, the representative um, – scale of the moon us only having one moon opposed to jupiter with the many moons that it has which is fascinating in itself because it kind of it speaks on a more symbolic level as well of the polarities that we have and obviously when we look in the sky because of the relative mass and size of the sun and the distance like they can look like very similar uh size discs in the sky you know one for night one for day and uh that symbolism of of two and duality and polarity is always kind of revolving um for us on earth and when we look up at that sky uh without even like in the context of of knowledge of that like we always had this kind of governing mechanism of, of the calendar systems of when does when to plant when to harvest when to you know when to move when to migrate and it was all kind of governed by those tides and that's uh you know that enlivens a sense of magic that we're sort of um participatory dance with the cosmos and with the planet and that's beautiful uh, Chris, you have so many things in that little comment that you just made. We're going to have to unpack them all. Disc size. We alluded mm -hmm. to that in the beginning. That the disc of the sun and the disc of the moon appear to be approximately the same size. Which is epic because it makes all kinds of things possible. Like, you know, our amazing eclipses that we mm -hmm. will talk about in a moment. But it, it's only at this particular time in history that this happens. You know, when the moon formed, as I said, it was much, much closer to the Earth. Yeah, probably like uh, you can see it in like some good sci-fi movies where you can look up at the sky, you know, and it looks like, oh, wow, we can just jump in the sky and I'm on the, I'm on the moon or another planet. And it's fantastic. So I love when we get those imagery now in our minds thanks to modern cinema. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the idea. It would have completely covered the sun when it was moving by, and we wouldn't have gotten the illusion of an eclipse with that golden halo around the edge of the moon. Yeah. So it took four billion years for it to get to its current location where we can see the moon align with the sun in a way to perfectly cover up the solar disk and radiate around it. And millions of years from now, it will be too small. First, it will be, oh, there will never be a total solar eclipse again. They will only be annular eclipses. That's just with like the ring of fire eclipses. And eventually the moon will get smaller and smaller and it won't even have the darkness to cover up the face of the sun. So we won't see an eclipse. Yeah, it might get slightly darker, uh, but the illusion, the magic will be gone. Yeah. And... Yeah. As we move forward in time, the moon will continue to spin further and further away. And eventually it would move away from the Earth altogether. And we wouldn't have its stabilizing influence anymore. Now, before you get all worried. <laughs> it's not happening next weekend. <laughs> not happening next weekend. Not happening in our lifetime. Uh, but I just, no other planet in our solar system has that illusion of eclipses 
like we do here on Earth. And it comes from that fact that you mentioned that the solar disk and the lunar disk are approximately the same size right now. And I'm going to like take over this with all my science facts. I'm so excited about my day. Oh, go for it. I'm like, listen, I'm like, oh, yeah, please go on, Donna. This is amazing. <laughs> it was like May of, I want to say 2013-ish. I was watching the sunset solar eclipse that was happening over Texas. It started in California and like raced all the way over here to Texas. And I got to see the very, very tail end of it. And I love watching sunset eclipses. They're always the best show because... The atmosphere is dimming it again a little bit and you just you see the moon a lot more clearly. And I start to wonder, I'm like, wow, I only got to see the tail end of it here in Austin. When am I gonna get to see one? Like a total, a real total solar eclipse. So I looked it up. And I saw in 2017 that we were going to have a total solar eclipse over the entire United States. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. I know it's five years in the future, but this is so amazing. So I spent the next five years bothering every astrologer, astrology organization, anybody I could think of who <laughs> would listen to me talk about the upcoming eclipse. <laughs> You're on the phone with NASA. And so because I was so fixated on this concept of eclipses, I wanted to know more about how they worked. I want to know how they worked in astrology. I already knew how they worked in science. And so I started reading everything that every astrologer has ever written. And there's some good things. Bernadette Brady has some great work. There's a few other authors that have some interesting things to say. But I realized that the way eclipse patterns form around the Earth, they start each each family of eclipses starts at either the North Pole or the South Pole. And if they're a North Pole eclipse, they're like pulsing from the North, getting bigger at the equators and then decreasing and disappearing at the South Pole. Or if they start at the South Pole, they're doing the opposite thing. So you get this pulse, 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 pulse. And each pulse lasts about 2,000, 3,000 years-ish. So a family of 20 of them will complete an entire 26,000 year cycle, the, the processional cycle. And even better, it's because every eclipse in the series is one third the way around the planet. And so if you turn the planet and look down from the pole, what you get, it's creating a flower of life pattern mm -hmm. and a network lattice around our planet as they pulse, pulse 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 and when i realized that i felt a lot more sympathy for the evolutionary astrologers and the mm. and the importance that they place on eclipses because they happen over such large cycles of time they do begin to approach the time it takes for biological evolution to occur and because they naturally fall into this flower of life pattern, which, if you know your history, you know, has been used since way back in the Egyptians and earlier as a, a pattern for the fundamental mathematics of growth and harmony that shows up in all kinds of things in our living world, from sunflowers to nautilus shells and more. It's how things grow. And that our crazy sun, moon, harmony, yin, yang would create this pattern around the earth. That's just pretty epic to me. It's totally epic and it's completely, it's completely magical. And I get giddy kind of talking and thinking about it too. With that flower of light pattern too, with the, the center of the Vesica Pisces that's there and that, that sacred eye. But like when you're talking about the poles on the eclipses and the North Pole, kind of the descending downward energy and then the South Pole, the pulling upward energy, you got the toroidal sort of funnels happening and the spin and the resonance. But then you're talking about that Kundalini rise and fall that, that happens and it's the Solomon seal. It's the inverted and, and upward pyramid happening and that those are the downward and upward currents that we kind of work through with the body and that's it's so awesome that, that you know the planet the body of the planet itself goes through that and those and it goes through those larger cycles of time and it's just everything is in flux and this beautiful tapestry is being woven by these cycles and it's 
it is is absolutely amazing. I mean, we can even talk about like you know another time, but like that the cycle of Venus and the pattern she forms, and it's so fascinating that we can now kind of observe these patterns that are being formed, these sacred geometry that are the underlying currents of just existence. And obviously, we've broken those down so often throughout culture that they become this metaphorical, abstract language to describe phenomenon. But then when we are able to actually contextualize and see it, see those patterns in the sky forming, because we have longer terms of observation now, it, it's it's fascinating. It's utterly beautiful, and it's it's filled with mystery, and, and, and it's just, I don't know. I don't know if there's any other way to describe it other than it's just, it's so beautiful. It really is. And... It underscores the importance of polarity. You know, I was thinking about this the other day. There's a big difference between duality and polarity. That's why people mm. um, in metaphysical circles like to um, diss on duality. But there's a reason. Duality says me, not me, or us and them it is two static opposites god and the devil good and evil never the twain shall meet and when it's static like that there's no creative tension and you can like say okay good versus evil good is better evil's you know evil's not so i'm just going to stay here in the good i'm going to forget mm -hmm. the evil and i'm going to push it away from me as far as possible and we create all kinds of challenges in our lives just like work is better than rest and you know patriarchy is better than matriarchy and all the other things all the other uh hierarchical systems that we create for ourselves white is better than black and so on have their roots in dualistic thinking and once you start looking at the moon and recognizing that there is movement and polarity within all life-giving systems. But we don't look at the moon and say, oh, the full moon is better than the new, the new moon. It's just the moon. <laughs> <laughs> there's only one moon, guys. There's only one. And you can't well, say... Well, some are better if you're stalking in a night. You know, go for the new, go for the new moon. Go for the dark moon. <laughs> they work with different things, maybe, but not better in the sense of mm. above or more important than. Can you imagine this conversation? I mean, we couldn't have eclipses if we didn't have the sun and the moon. Or if we only had daytime all the time and there was no night, you know, again, life would be dramatically different. Yeah. And so what makes you think you can live in a purely solar world? Thing is, you can't. And this gets back to the other thing about having two poles. You need those two different streams of energy to create the hologram. Right. And to create life and motion. But real quick, we do need those polarities to actually create motion. That pulling intention creates that motion, which is life. And that is like the, the realm of duality and polarity. But like you're right. When you get kind of uh, caught up in the us versus them that pull and take one is better than the other then then you're kind of biased towards one pole which isn't the 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 complete complex system of duality in itself but then there is that realm of non-duality out the, the container for the system itself and that's a different thing <laughs> <laughs> But yes, holographic universe fear theory. This is a fun one. Holograms are super cool. They're super cool because every little bit of the holographic image creates the contains the entirety of the image in the space. Perhaps less intense, but it still creates the entirety of the image. It's a very holistic way of looking at the cosmos, like saying the universe in a grain of sand if you're a poet. But the way holographic, holograms work is that you have a light source that interacts with something, and the light source that is beam is split into two, and they're sent through different paths, and that when the two beams are brought back together again, they interact with each other, and their interference pattern creates 
the image that we see as the hologram. And so basically what it's saying is that you, we all need polarity to create the illusion of our three dimensional world that contains depth. It's the, it's the, it's the interaction between the poles that creates our human experience in three dimensions. But I would also argue that if you try to take one side of the equation out, like if you try to live only in the yang active mm -hmm. side, or it flip side is also a problem. You can't just live in the yin side either and just sleep all the time and not do anything. Um, oh, that sounds lovely. <laughs> It does, but only because we're like overwhelmed on the other side. <laughs> if you were to do that, you would lose the dimension of our experience. You know, to only be in the active world, you begin to lose the emotional soundtrack and the feeling of soul that gives something magical to all of our experiences. Whereas if you lived only in the yin, you might have that constant feeling that would be rich and evocative, but you wouldn't have anywhere to steer the boat. Right. <laughs> you would just get bounced from thing to thing to thing. We need both in proper proportion. Right. Then you're poised on that middle way. You're in that center point. What is our kind of earthly experience with that material realm, like the two poles of two beams of light joining at that center point, contextualizing our reality? That's that center point. And that's that. The uh, altar in my hermetic <laughs> teacher's tradition uh, would have a candle holder on it. And the candle holder would is two two pillars on the side and one slightly taller pillar in the middle. So it's a three candle holder, mm -hmm. but it automatically suggests the polarity, in case right and left, and then the center place where that they meet, which is our conscious awareness of living in polarity and weaving together our creative journey. And that's the role of our observing consciousness in this whole mix. The center of the whirlwind, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, another beautiful example example of that holographic theory was like Indra's net and the many jeweled worlds and universes and galaxies are held in that. And actually uh, the visionary artist, Alex Gray, painted a beautiful depiction of that one. Basically the, the whole webbed patterned veil of reality and it's just the holographic universe kind of repeating itself over and over and over and over again the multiverses and um the many existence that are all in this container this whole web that are interconnected yet separate yet one is the same i mean we can get into fourth dimensional travel that way as well i mean we don't you know we need to be building spaceships everything is literally connected you know that that inward reflection kind of going outward into the world. And uh, it's it's an absolutely beautiful one. All right, um, we're going to put that in the show notes so you can all okay, check it that's, out. That's a good point. That's a good, good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in a, another episode, Fritjof Capra's book, I, I'm pretty sure we mentioned it, uh, The Tao of Physics. Uh, he has a large section on the holographic universe theory and kind of um, paralleling it with what he called, he just groups it as Eastern mythology. So he's talking about like, uh, the Tao, uh, Vedic thought, uh, Buddhist thought, and it's beautiful examples of the mythology and then blending that with modern physics. I mean, he wrote that, I think, in 1975, but it went through so many different editions, and I didn't get around to reading it until, I don't know, maybe five to ten years ago, and it was still pertinent, and it was still, like, all the, the research was completely relevant, and um, I think Joseph Campbell was a big fan of that one. Yeah, I like it, too. Yeah, it, it's just, it's a fun one to go back to. And it's just nice. I, I love comparative mythology books, like having all the, everything sort of connected and, and seeing how these storylines are just universal. I remember when I got my hands on that book, I was a, I had just finished my undergraduate degree. And I had this summer, which would you would highly approve of. I graduated and the end of 
May, and I wasn't moving until Texas until um, the end of July, and so I had like three months and nothing to do. And <laughs> so I wandered around Ann Arbor, and I hit every bookstore, and I spent the entire summer sitting in my open window on my bed reading books on physics. And I fell in love with this movie that was playing at the uh, State Theater in Ann Arbor. And I would sit in the balcony. It was called Mind Walk. And it was all about a conversation between a physicist, a politician, and an advertising executive. And they were walking around Mont Saint-Michel talking about you know, life, the universe, and everything, the all of these things that we talk about on this show. Maybe that's why this show exists. It's because I watched that movie 10 times sitting in the balcony of the State Theater. And the inspiration for that movie was, uh, it was directed by Brent Capra, who was Friedhof Capra's brother. Friedhof Capra is the one who wrote The Tao of Physics. And so I got The Turning Point, which is what the movie is based on. And then, of course, that led to me going and getting The Tao of Physics. And so it was on the pile of physics books that I read that summer. And um, it, is a, it is a way of linking spirituality and physics. Mm -hmm. I think that's become prevalent today. We take for granted, perhaps. Um, but I think 30 years ago, it wasn't quite as obvious in new agey circles no it um, wasn't and you know i think that's also um you know a great asset of what the, the realms of quantum physics and, and that bridging that gap like there there were conversations kind of budding around but that's kind of like taboo in a science field of strict materialist science to bring in this realm of spirituality but it does intersect and like it is that line of intersection where it becomes the you know the material becomes the immaterial and you can't have the material without the immaterial and it's this perfect bridge that's why it's so exciting to keep track of like the these new breakthroughs that are happening because it's not saying that a one is better than the other um or uh, you know one has you know become uh before the other or anything like that but it's this interconnection and this necessity of these different states that kind of reflect and, and um, kind of merge and uh, perpetuate each other. They're one and the same. They're like, you know, the, the upside, <laughs> upside down world, you know, the inverse world. And I think it's absolutely fascinating. And that if you take in the context of just the way conscious thought can, you know, change ops, you know, the observation phenomenon and how that can change experiments and, how we never really can have a proper control because life is constantly in motion. Time is in motion. It's never the same state at all. We're always in flux. And I think that is so fascinating. I don't know. I have fun with that. <laughs> <laughs> I think you hit the nail on the head when you start talking about the power of the observer the power mm. of consciousness in this mix. Because if someone were to come up to me and say, I'm burned out. I mean, I know what the problem is. I can see what you're saying makes total sense. How do I stop yeah. getting into the same cycle over and over again? And I hear the words of my hermetic teacher in my head, which still make me laugh, basically, as you just do it. <laughs> You just do it. <laughs> you just, but there's wisdom in that. And the wisdom is in the, you have to slow down enough to be present to yourself. So if you want the Western overachiever set of instructions, step zero is slow everything down. Just like you would slow down a movie or a sports play so that you can see what happens in the action once you slow it down you get to reconnect and be present in what is happening in the moment and if you can yeah, slow take down breath. take a breath and be part of the process again you open up your ability to choose and when you open up your ability to choose more possibilities 
become available to you. Um, people like to argue all the time, is it fate or is it free will? Right. Yeah, on some metaphysical level, both are true simultaneously. But let's not get into that. The bigger problem is, I think, that most people are running around like such crazy people mm -hmm. without chance to think. All they're doing is responding. Yeah. You can't have free will, even the illusion of free will, if you don't slow down. Right, you're always in this reactive state. Exactly. And so that's where mindfulness can come from. And the moon in Indian astrology is the planet that has to do with mind, or at least the mind field. If you think about the contents of mind as one thing and the field in which the stuff is happening, the, the field is the moon. And so when you understand the nature of your field, because you sat and become present to its movements, like the ocean, then you can begin to choose differently. And even the act of just sitting and slowing down will bring more spaciousness and will start the process of unwinding the crazy, crazy that you have been existing in. Exactly. Absolutely. Actually, that step back also can make you more efficient as well. If you take, like, say, a, you know, 30 minutes to go meditate, then you're thinking, like, oh, I'm losing 30 minutes. I don't have time for 30 minutes. But you'll be surprised of like how much like you can actually then can accomplish in a shorter frame of mind too, a shorter uh, frame of time. Excuse me, shorter frame of mind. That's actually perfect. <laughs> yeah, and I'm actually really glad you brought that up because there was something I, I wanted to talk about earlier, but it kind of drifted away. But it came back, so thank you. Like the tides, so I appreciate that. Uh, it's it's another thing like when we're feeling kind of stuck or in that period of depression. You know, the moon's a great reminder that you know everything changes there's you're not going to be stuck in that forever you're going to have another opportunity there's going to be another cycle and you can start again like you're not going to be completely stuck in the same pattern all the time there's always this opportunity to you know a, a new cycle starts like every month another cycle starts and it's also like if you do use a like the moon as a barometer for change in your life and it's a, it's a beautiful kind of ally for that because Every new moon, you can sort of seed something little, something new that you want to kind of integrate in your reality and change it. So you're kind of syncing up then with this natural rhythm that can incorporate this uh, new way of being. I mean, it could be something simple as like a new project. Like I always like to do it on a creative cycle, starting new projects or new levels of a project. If it's like something that I'm tethering together through many cycles and it kind of... Um, so I would go into a period of rest before that dark moon, not touching anything, working on that. And then I'm rejuvenated. I can dive into that or start something new. And that there's this, this energy source available for that, that can completely wax to, uh, waxes to that full moon. And then it starts to kind of wane. And I think it's a great rhythm to, to sync up to, to actually change or create. Um, and, you know, yeah. How amazing is that Chris can you imagine how different life would be if instead of starting a project like okay I got to do this I got to do that mm -hmm. I got to do this you started the project was okay I have to sit here I have to be still I have to sleep I have to make space and that's the actual beginning of your project yeah that's mind blowing. Chris, thank you. I'm going to write this down. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I know it really is. And it's, um, I feel like a natural hack too, in a lot of ways. I mean, there's a lot of these, we're always trying to hack and optimize our, <laughs> our experience in the Western world. And so much of it is like, let's step back and like, let's just li listen to nature, look at what the world does and tune into it. And then, then you're in this flow. You know, we're back in that flow state really, really easily. And yeah, it's pretty much with stillness. Yeah, so which all stems stem and it's very like the it's very much like the dark moon and it's very much like the trees and the plants and which gets so much nourishment from the moon from nighttime. And um, that that point of stillness, that that pregnant kind of moment of of anticipation of possibility that's there. That's all from that gestation point. 
And then that creation kind of flowers, that light of the moon starts building and motion starts happening. And then, yeah, then it culminates. And then, and then there's that pullback. The tides are returning and retreating. Chris, did you have to learn how to rest or does it come by you naturally? I had to learn to accept that, to listen to my body that like it needed to rest. I need to rest and not feel like completely bad about it. I'm also a super lunar child. I mean, if anyone out there knows astrology, I have like a fourth house cancer moon. So I'm very much governed, governed by the moon tides. And I learned to, like, to listen to that because it's obviously completely alien to our world. Like we always have to be doing something. We always have to be on. And that like I felt that burnout, you know, in an earlier self for, for sure. It's like, oh, why is this? And then being okay that like, oh, no, I just want to, you know, I want to rest today. I want to sleep in. I want to read. I just want to nur- nourish myself. We call it self-care now just to be like <laughs> acceptable that we are actually doing something um, kind of constructive for ourselves, whether that's just like taking a bath or just going out and looking at the moon. But those are all, I mean, that's a vital point of life. Those pauses are vital points of life. That's, I don't think that's necessarily self-care as much as just being alive and an organic (laughs) being, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So yes and no, definitely like didn't have to learn it, but I had to allow myself to accept that and be okay with that and feel like that is normal. I don't think I'll ever learn this. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough one. It really is. Was that too self-revelatory? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's perfect. hilarious. Yeah. Mm. My way of learning things is usually to run into the brick wall, stand up, go, huh. That didn't oh, work. Let I- me try again. Run into the brick wall again. <laughs> Hmm. I'd be lying if I was guilty of that as well. (laughs) (laughs) For sure. For sure. Oh, dear. We're both speaking from experience. (laughs) (laughs) But that's also part of, like, the trial and error of of life. Maybe more errors than trials. I don't know. (laughs) But it's, yeah. um, I don't know. Like, those, those mistakes and those hitting the brick walls can totally... Kind of, you can figure out where your your reality walls are. It's like well, poking around in the dark. You know, I, I, I like the simple. Simple is usually best. Mm-hmm. And so, given that the moon can symbolically represent anything that exists as a active and rest mechanic find the simplest ones and the simplest one to me is the breath Mm -hmm. we breathe in it's like a full moon we breathe out it's like a dark moon because it's breathing in to fullness and breathing out to stillness can you imagine what would happen if we tried to breathe in? <gasps> Never let time? it out because I'm going to stay up here all the time and I'm not going to stop. And I'm just going to keep going and going and going and going. And eventually I think I might fall over, but I think I don't have to do it right now. How long do you think I can talk without actually having to let my breath out? Until you pass out and your body makes you. Same thing you're just holding your breath all along. How, how long are you going to do that before you're forced to take another inhale? <laughs> All right, so while we're watching our breath, it's amazing as soon as you say, watch your breath. As you breathe in and breathe out, people feel the need to clench at part of it Mm -hmm. or control some part of it. And you know what? You don't need to because you're going to keep breathing anyway. And this gets back to being in that observer witness state in the process if you're actually going to follow your breath without interfering you are learning what it means to let go and simply witness what is happening 
naturally around you. And just tapping into that witness state has so many powerful benefits for unwinding whatever talky stuff you have going on in your head, all the judgments that you're making of yourself, the judgments that you're making of other people, the judgments you're making about what you're doing, and just recognize the process that we're living in. I think the moon can teach us that too. It totally can. And that's actually very fascinating to watch like your breath, especially if you're going into like maybe uncomfortable situations and you just tune back into your breath, you know, you feel like, oh, well, you're, you're constricting a little bit because you're nervous or something like that. And I think it's fascinating to witness because then too, when you're just constantly observing and watching it, then you can kind of tune in like, okay, I am constricting. I'm like, something's like, you know, making me nervous or um, I'm scared about something. And then you can sort of just release that uh, yourself and then tune back into that, just that natural rhythm. And then you're kind of operating from the center of stillness which is always important because that's like, you know, that poison, that middle of that hologram right there of, uh, of reality. And then you can kind of, you know, not say you're withdrawn, completely detached, but you're kind of having that bird's eye view of the situation. And um, I think that's a, a very potent ally in so many scenarios. We have come to a logical conclusion with this episode and we've already given you the experiment which why don't you just sit and follow your breath maybe even add a visualization to it where you breathe in and you imagine the full moon and you breathe out you imagine the moon darkening to the dark part of the moon and as you breathe in seeing the crescent appear all the way up to the full moon again and just do that for a few minutes tune in with yourself and do the best you can to not clutch, not constrict in the process and see where it leads you. Well, that was fun. And I hoped you enjoyed thinking more about the moon and how it reflects our own lives in today's show. If you find out that you are more curious about the moon than you ever imagined, well, then I have good news for you. I have a brand new mini course that's offered through my Magic and Mastery School called Secrets of Moon Magic. All you have to do is go over to www.magicandmastery.com moon to find out more information on how you can learn how to work with the cycles of moon in your own life to manifest your own desires. Before you go, don't forget to check out the show notes at uh, www.magicandmastery.com slash podcast. That's where you can find the books and the art and everything else under the sun that we've mentioned. And we also included timestamps and, li and, and different links to those as well. Um, so that's, again, that's at www.magicandmastery.com slash podcast. And thank you again for tuning into this episode. And please take a moment to go on over to your podcast service and rate and review this podcast because that's what enables us to figure out what makes you jazz so that we can continue to bring you podcasts that you love. And if you like it, why don't you share it with a friend?